सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली I'm with Dr. Sanjay Baru, former editor of the Financial Express newspaper and former media advisor to uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, former Prime Minister of India, and Mr. N. Ram, former editor in chief of the Hindu newspaper and director of the Hindu Publishing Group. And today, of course, we are talking about the big media story: raids on the BBC's offices here in New Delhi and in Mumbai are still continuing. It's been over 24 hours. the income tax authorities came into the bbc's offices uh, in both these cities at about 11:30 am on tuesday and they were there overnight computers have been seized phones of journalists have been seized uh, evidently the raids are being uh, carried out under section 133a of the um, of the income tax rules but nobody really knows what's going on so may i come to you dr baru first and foremost as a former journalist as a current journalist you write columns all the time what is your take on what's going on well i mean my take is very simple that uh, this action is uh, the timing is uh, very very shady uh, it comes soon after a documentary on the bbc on prime minister modi and therefore the timing uh, raises uh, serious questions uh, second thing is i find it very odd that telephones of journalists are being seized if the accusation is about tax payment uh, or transfer pricing issues i can understand their records being checked and then the financial uh, staff being uh, you know interviewed why the me the journalists working at bbc should be subject to any form of harassment when they have nothing to do with the financial side of the functioning of the firm uh, really beats me so i i conclude from the manner in which this has been done and the timing of this action Uh, that is, this is uh, one more of those steps taken uh, in the recent past against the wire against uh, the enig baskar etc to tell the media that you know there are certain things uh, there are certain red lines like uh, what what are these red lines uh, sanjay dr baru well cl- clearly the red lines are no criticism of prime minister modi not mm-hmm. at all so that mr mr ram what are, what are these red lines if as dr baru is saying that it's Okay the question to you what are these red lines Yeah I think you criticize exactly what he said uh, if you criticize uh, uh, the prime minister Narendra Modi and particularly his role in 2002 during the anti muslim pogrom in Gujarat mm-hmm. uh, and and then to to uh, further to uh, if you explore what i would call a genetic the genetic connection between 2002 and today what's happening to indian muslims post especially post 2019 which was the theme of the uh, british uh, bbc's documentary the two episode documentary called india the modi question then that's uh, that's a super red line for the, for them and all this talk about the supreme court being dishonored or undermining the uh, integrity and sovereignty of india is just uh, just what it is it's complete nonsense because there's nothing against the supreme court i i watched the uh, the two episodes very closely several times and there's absolutely nothing except to say they set up an sit and the sit found no evidence for prosecution of the prime of uh, the then chief minister of gujarat so right. that, that is the real red line and the fact uh, and they didn't really bother with uh, trying to block the episode 2 of their documentary mm-hmm. so they it was clear to everybody that the red line was questioning this uh, the 2002 role uh, and so on and yeah so l- let me let's just take all these points one by one the first is that actually nobody has been told we haven't been told in the media or the people of india haven't been told why the bbc is being raided they're talking about like you said dr baru's transfer pricing i don't even understand what that phrase means but if Mr Ram as you say that this is probably related to the BBC documentary on the Gujarat riots you know 20 more than 20 long years ago what is it that is making this government so sensitive 
that you cannot criticize what happened in the Gujarat riots. You cannot criticize the alleged involvement of then Chief Minister Narendra Modi. What is it that we cannot, that the media in India and abroad cannot criticize? Mr. Ram? Yes, you don't quite know what, what the hell, because uh, they, they did these uh, so-called surveys uh, under uh, uh, Section 133A and Section 133B of the uh, Income Tax Act of 1961. It is supposed to be limited to business premises only, but were they limited only to business premises? Uh, does a survey give you the uh, authority to uh, take away phones of journalists and so on? If that is information is verified, it's clearly illegal as well, apart from being anti-democratic. But uh, so I think, uh, uh, so it's not just uh, a highly credible organization. Of course, that hurts the most, like the BBC, which I'd say is the most credible media organization, uh, internationally speaking, uh, because of its track record. Although we have plenty of differences with the BJP's coverage of this or that, you know, criticism, biases, etc. But that, but it's if a highly credible organization does something like that documentary, then that's uh, that, that becomes intolerable for the this government, which is a government of censorship. It's not a government of total censorship, such as we witnessed during the emergency, but creeping censorship, selectively targeted at certain critics. If a critic is highly credible, then that's an inviting target. So that's a, uh, 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 but if it's also a news click or news laundry or, of course, Dainik Bhaskar is a very big player in Hindi language journalism. Uh, they, they also used, uh, you know, the, the same technique. But this business of the survey is the bottom of their of the hierarchy for the income tax department. Okay. Uh, then comes a search, right? Uh, under Section One Thirty Two of the of the Act, uh, and so on. But but these are really raids carried out in surprise, you know, element of surprise uh, meant to uh, scare people, mm -hmm. to keep them in the premises and so on. So it, it, not, maybe nothing will come out of it at the end, but the process is the punishment, as lawyers say. Right. And, and that's what they're trying, but it's very, very ill-conceived. It's very, very foolish and over the top. To take on the BBC like this, as soon after that documentary was so. Whatever you say, everyone links it with that, with what what was uh, made available only to UK viewers. Right in and India, you we didn't even see it in or, India. You, you a few people would have seen it because sooner or later BBC studios would have been taken down for copyright yeah. reasons, copyright infringement. But this is what they call the stress and effect. You try to suppress something. In this kind of way, then the whole thing becomes, you uh, know, big. Many more people see it, uh, and in this case, it happened. Mass screening, students wanting right. to see it being detained. Yeah, everyone I know has either seen it or will see it soon. Absolutely, but let me ask you, Doctor Varu, the question that I'm asking you both: What is it? Why is it that you cannot criticize the Prime Minister? Now, you've been former media advisor to the prime, to former prime minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Did, was he never criticized? And when he was, were you guys really sensitive about the fact that, oh, the media or the press is criticizing? Well, you know, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, first of all, uh, if you look at the episode one of the BBC documentary, one of the interesting points that comes through is the prime minister, uh, Mr. Modi, at that time, chief minister says, when he's asked, um, you know, what is it that he feels he has not got right or some such question? He says the one, one or oh, what regret does he have? That's right. He was asked, <laughs> what is your one regret? Uh, he says, my one regret is that I had not understood how to control the media. Uh, he actually says that, right? And we have seen over the last several years a very effective me method of controlling the media. Now, it's a very selective uh, approach. The mass media, major television channels, major uh, Indian language publications. So I think the interesting thing is that um, at home in India, already uh, the uh, Prime Minister Modi and the government have succeeded in ensuring self-censorship on the part of media. You know, we, we don't often talk about this. Uh, but I think what I what I worry about as much as governmental pressure on the media 
is the ready self censorship that a lot of publications and television channels are happily imposing on themselves uh, i mean i i have been a victim of this myself when i was told by a certain editor when i wrote something for the newspaper or magazine that can you avoid saying this i said why oh, no no it's better you know just delete these two sentences now that is self censorship that means it is not something that's been published and somebody in government is angry it's the editor who's saying don't say it and and i think a lot of that is happening at home mr ram do you agree do you agree that journalists like us are, are self censoring ourselves are you self censoring yourself i'm not i think i i'm not because i i have evidence of that and i don't think sanjay will either so but uh, to a very large extent that is being that, that is the case That's right why? now why the fear the fear of these raids you don't want uh, these uh, surveys you don't want these searches you don't want arrests which have taken place of journalists or worse because some of these thugs have also resorted to killings mm -hmm. uh, and so on so people are afraid uh, so this but on the other hand there are still spaces which is why this is not an emergency there are spaces for us to have a discussion like this we've had many such i've had with karan tapar i've had with rajdeep and so on and i'm sure sanjay has his own spaces where he can express freely his position we are responsible also we know what uh, uh, you know how, how to be lawful when you write but we uh, we certainly speak up so uh, but to a large extent it happens in media organizations also those with business interests right are uh, worried about this uh, i think because, uh, so this uh, this connection between the business interests of the media organization and the fear by the owner or by the proprietor that his or her business interests could be hurt you think that is a valid reason for this self censorship not acceptable reason but understandable that's what i'd say because uh, this but on uh, another point jyoti uh, if i may come in you mentioned the doctor you asked him the question but i, I no sure I, please come in yeah uh, uh, dr manmohan singh whatever differences one had with dr manmohan singh i'll give this to him never have he faced any pressure uh, let alone this kind of awful uh, attacks or assaults uh, under his uh, his government and i would go back and say it didn't even happen with Rajiv Gandhi's government uh, during the Bofors investigation. We had a free hand. Nor with Atul Bihari Vajpayee. Pardon? Yeah. Nor with Vajpayee. Uh, I mean. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Nor with what the Vajpayee government. Absolutely true. So now, so Rajiv Gandhi, Atul Bihari Vajpayee, Dr. Manmohan Singh. What about Indira Gandhi? Did Do you guys remember that she imposed the emergency after all? I court. didn't. I didn't write anything that would warrant <laughs> attention from Indira Gandhi at that time. I was opposed to the emergency. I worked in my own way, but uh, uh, suddenly, organizations, including the one I I come from, uh, buckled under the uh, under the threat. There's no doubt. I mean, that's a fact of history. Uh, but that was different. It was the emergency when there was total censorship uh, and so on. But I would give Dr. Manmohan Singh the highest marks in this respect. Uh, he not only would he. He, he, I think he would feel squeamish. It would go against his grain to try to uh, enforce censorship uh, on this. However, unhappy he may have been with some, some, uh, something we wrote or some somebody else wrote. But I think these were those were good traditions. Indira Gandhi. That was some Congress people would say it's an aberration. I don't think so. There was an autocratic tendency at at, at that time as well. Uh, but. Uh, that's different that's a it would be a category mistake i think to compare the emergency with what's happening today because there are still large spaces in india india cannot be totally controlled or speech, free speech across india cannot be totally controlled however hard they may try despite this pervasiveness of self censorship in the uh, established media in the legacy media in particular that that's a fair point sanjay can i ask you about dr manmohan singh when you were his media advisor i mean he was pretty much battered on a lot of issues whether it was on the indo us nuclear deal at the time or whether it was india's relationship with pakistan after the 2008 mumbai attacks how did you guys deal with the criticism uh, i mean <laughs> the criticism was taken as part of uh, the freedom of the of media i mean i don't think anybody in government even you know it, it i cannot recall even one uh, time 
that anybody, not just Dr. Manmohan Singh, but anybody around him in the Prime Minister's office would say that, you know, we should teach somebody a lesson or we should go after somebody. Never. And, and I keep reminding my friends uh, who are now in the BJP, who are then in the media, many of them were very vocal critics of Dr. Manmohan Singh. I mean, Arnab Goswami and Navika Kumar, who are in Times Now, let me name them. Very, very severe critics of Dr. Manmohan Singh in the period when I was there. I mean, I left, as you know, Prime Minister's office by 2009. Uh, but but in that, even in that period, Arnab had just come into uh, Times Now. They were carrying a lot of uh, stuff on, on their channel, which was critical of the Prime Minister. I never picked up the phone and asked them to stop doing that. You know, I I I, the, the, I would pick up the phone certainly and ask them why they were doing that to understand you know what is the motive behind something. But I would never say don't do it. You know, mm -hmm. and I was never asked not to do it. I mean, I, I, Mr. Ram is absolutely right. Dr. Manmohan Singh, you know, it's not in his DNA. But I would say the same thing for uh, his three two predecessors. I don't recall in uh, Narasimha Rao's time. I was in the Economic Times uh, in uh, during Prime Minister Narasimha Rao's. Harshad Mehta scam. I mean, it was one of the biggest challenges he faced as Prime Minister when all of us on a daily basis were reporting the entire scam. Sucheta was, Dalal was in the Times of India and she was writing in Times. I was in the Economic Times. We were writing in the Economic Times. Nobody ever uh, stopped us from publishing. The entire Harshad Mehta scam was covered by the media with complete freedom. And again with Mr. Vajpayee, I mean, the Pahelka tapes, for example, happened during Vajpayee's time. The Banga, Bangaru Lakshman and all those incidents. Did the Vajpayee government, uh, you know, bam, uh, terrorize the media? Certainly not. I think part of the problem uh, for uh, at least our generation of the media is we got used to those 20 years from 1991 to, uh, to 2014, 25 years of relative freedom. You know, people forgot the emergency. The emergency was a distant memory. Uh, and then suddenly you come across a regime that is so sensitive, so uh, unwilling to uh, you know, tolerate criticism. And as Mr. Ram said very correctly, there are still spaces. I mean, the very fact that you're recording this conversation uh, su suggests that you, know, you feel free to do so. Right. But a large part of this is in the English language. I'm not sure how much of it is there in the Hindi language. Particularly in the, I'm sure in Tamil Nadu, where the BJP is still not you know, that powerful. Maybe in, in the Tamil media, there's a lot of freedom. Yeah. Uh, just as there is, just as there is in the Telugu media, I can tell you in Telangana and and Andhra, the Telugu media is not scared of Delhi. But where Delhi exists in the local media, particularly in the Hindi media, and that is why Dhanik Bhaskar was targeted. But let me ask you, Mr. Ram, uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, Prime Minister of India from the BJP, Narendra Modi, of, of the BJP, Prime Minister of India. Uh, Mr. Modi very often sort of considers himself an inheritor of that legacy. But what is it about them? You, you said that Mr. Vajpayee didn't uh, have any problem being criticized. And you remember when, the, when it was under him that India went nuclear in 1998. And there was a lot of criticism about that, in, including in your own newspaper at the time. So what is it about Prime Minister Modi of the BJP which is different from Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Yeah, in fact, uh, Prime Minister Vajpayee, despite our criticism of the BB, uh, even opposition, editorial opposition to the BJP's agenda, uh, was good enough to come for our 125th anniversary celebration as a chief guest and, and uh, lauded the newspaper in large part. Uh, that, so that was Vajpayee. We had absolutely no problem with dealing with him. You could uh, meet him, etc. Uh, but... Uh, uh, to to be fair to Mr. Modi, when he was chief minister of Gujarat, I had a number of interactions with him, although our newspaper didn't really matter in Gujarat, but he kept in constant touch. And there are some occasions where, uh, uh, you know, we were able to have our way. Uh, for, I, in fact, I can say it now, the privilege motion against, uh, one of, uh, 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 I think Gujarat Samachar was dropped because I, uh, I, I, I intervened and asked, uh, you know, to, uh, made this request to Chief Minister Modi, and he quickly dropped it. It's mm -hmm. when this uh, transformation became came to Delhi and became a prime minister with the opposition weakening like this and BJP becoming d uh, dominant with other strongmen, home minister and all that, uh, coming there together with the RSS, being able to advance 
uh, and put forward his agenda with the what they call the second coming of Hindutva. It's then that uh, all this began to happen. Awful things happened in Gujarat to Muslims, all, and, and also it started with Godra. That's in the documentary also. Uh, but uh, uh, so far as the media were concerned, I wouldn't have complained very much about what happened in Gujarat uh, with uh, Chief Minister Modi, as far as I know. I could be, uh, because that privilege motion was dropped. I, I, they, I don't think there were police actions against uh, media in Gujarat at that time, because the BJP was felt we Now they feel strengthened or empowered to do uh, all these anti-democratic actions. But so to empowered. Use these agencies. No, but use do, these agencies. Feel, listen, so do they feel so empowered that they can uh, feel insecure? Do you think that they're insecure about the fact uh, that people are criticizing them and therefore they're cracking down on organizations like the BBC or the Benik Bhaskar News Laundry News Click? I think so far as the BBC is concerned, they would be insecure because this reaches a global audience. And I would like to connect this to uh, a an outline of a framework that uh, Mukul Keshavan suggested in an article in The Guardian. I have it right here before me on screen. Narendra Modi is struggling to be both anti-Muslim strongman and global leader. Uh, and this particularly applies to the time of uh, our presidency of G20. That's right. Published on, uh, please read that, published on, if those who haven't, uh, February February 8th in The Guardian, it's freely accessible. The point he makes is there are contradictory messages being given to uh, the domestic audience and the international audience. On the one hand, here, by proceeding against the uh, BJP and, D I mean, uh, the BBC and demonizing the BBC, the way that spokesman did yes, well, the other day, yeah. you know, using vulgar language. Yeah. Against, he, uh, he used the words brushed and yeah. he used the words brashtachar and bakwas. So these yeah. are two or three words he used. So corrupt and bakwas, bakwas, like no nonsense. And so that would presumably appeal to a large section of their domestic constituency. But internationally, it hurts. This action hurts. So uh, there's a contradiction between wanting to be an anti-Muslim strongman and global leader, particularly mm -hmm. in the time of uh, G G G20 presidency, but even without, even outside that. So, and this contradiction cannot be resolved because again, because the they catch up. The message you're giving here catches up there. Your actions ha have an impact uh, abroad as well, and it hurts your image. Uh, you're now being seen in the company of the Turkish strongman and the Hungarian strongman and the and. Uh, CC, who came here uh, as an honored guest during the uh, Republic on Republic Day uh, of Egypt. Uh, so I think uh, so that, that's the problem he's facing, I think, the prime minister and his government. So, Sanjay, that's my, uh, Dr. Bharat, my, that's my next question to you. India is the leader of the G20 this year. We are in the middle of the G20 uh, celebration. And as we all know, the G20 is the 20 of the largest. The, 20 largest economies of the world. This is not a mean achievement for, for India, a developing country, to lead the G20 is a big deal. So why would the government of India, Prime Minister Modi's government, why would it do something like this, crack down on an international media organization at a time like this? Won't they send absolutely the wrong signal that the world's largest democracy is cracking down on the media? Look, first of all, we are hosting one annual meeting of the G20. It's not a big deal. Last year, Indonesia did it. Next year, Brazil will do it. The year after that, South Africa will do it. It's by turns. Every country gets to host the G20. So it's not a big deal that suddenly India is hosting G20. It's a different matter that this government has decided to use the G20 as a way of, you know, projecting itself as a kind of Vishwa Guru, global leader, etc. And, and the fact is, um, Jyoti, the Prime Minister and the current regime in Delhi is riding on a great opportunity provided by the world to India, which is that the world's great powers are fighting each other. Mm. And in a context where the US and China and Russia are all kind of fighting each other, uh, India as a country, it's nothing to do with who the Prime Minister is. India as a country has acquired this opportunity to once again be the voice of the global south which is what we were in the 50s and 60s during the Cold War when the US and the Soviet Union were at loggerheads, right? That space given by big power conflict, uh, 
which had kind of gone away. In but the surely East. India is is leading that space, and that's no, no, what this leader. In, India is leading it. Of course, India is leading it because right now we are hosting G20. But the point I'm making is that the Prime Minister is riding on a wave that is India's wave. I mean, even if he were not the Prime Minister, if Devagoda were the Prime Minister today, India would have this opportunity. Because no, but it's, is... it's not, listen, we have to give him credit. It's Prime Minister Modi's leadership over the last nine years. Before that, when he inherited the mantle from Dr. Manmohan Singh, who's, who was in power for 10 years. Yes, you're right. It's India's leadership. But Prime Minister Modi is today at the helm of India. So therefore, he's leading our country. No, no, no. Please let me finish what I'm saying. Sorry. Because it is that opportunity that he thinks the global, you know, the international community uh, will not criticize him for what he's doing. I mean, you're buying Boeings from America, you're buying Airbus from France, you're buying weapons from Russia, you're allowing China to run a huge trade deficit. You know, you're literally buying up friendships. And you're giving aid to several other countries. You're giving COVID vaccines. So there is an environment in which many countries are dependent on India, which is a, a good moment for India. I mean, let's face it, uh, there's a sweet spot. I mean, if you look, you know, the geopolitical analysts use the phrase, India is in a sweet spot. Of course, we're in a sweet spot. So I think he thinks, okay, I can do what I like with BBC, but Rishi Sunak is not going to, you know, back off on, on whatever... Uh, you know, he wants out of India because this is an opportune moment for, for India. Do you agree, Mr. Ram? Yes, I, I largely agree with that. Uh, uh, there are many, but, but you are scoring, uh, some people would say, an own goal. I would use the word acrasia. Going back to old Greek philosophy, you do something you know is wrong. You do something that you know is against your own interests. So why do it? Uh, so I can't understand why they did it to be. It makes no sense to me. It was it's a comedy of follies. First trying to block something that would have been taken down anyway, which would have been seen by fewer people, and then doing this, uh, claiming that it's a sur you know is it a survey or a search or does this does this damage India's reputation? Of it does. It, the it, world's it, largest it, damage, it damages the reputation of the Modi government. It's not just India. India may still be separate, differentiated from the Modi government, because there is opposition in India to what has happened to the BBC. There are We speak up for the BBC. Whatever differences we have with the BJP, this censorship and this harassment of the BBC in India is totally unjustified. It's anti-democratic. It's unacceptable to us as Democrats. So in that sense, there is a clear differentiation between the image of the Modi government and what uh, the opposition is saying, including the Congress party, which has come out very strongly against uh, the latest action against the BBC. So I think uh, okay, it's, so suddenly it's hurting. It's, uh, it's a real blow to the, this image at this time, because we are, you read the editorial in the New York Times about three days ago on, on the same question, or the articles that have been published in The Guardian. And I bet that every major media organization in some way or the other, has expressed some critical opinion on it, on what is uh, uh, how you have dealt with this documentary and the sequel to it. So, Dr. Barut, the point that Mr. Ram is saying that this is damaging or will damage or has damaged India's reputation, Prime Minister's Mo Prime Minister Modi's own reputation as a global leader, and the fact that India is celebrating 75 years as a democracy. I mean, we have muddled through in many ways. There has been an emergency that Indira Gandhi imposed for uh, two years uh, and, and some months. Now, the, my question to you is that, that while, so this democracy that, you know, how, does, how, will, how do people abroad then look at India's democracy? Well, we are not just 75 years. Uh, we are supposed to be the mother of democracy. Uh, according to Mr. Modi, democracy goes back into ancient India. Um, and and, and no, that is the point. I mean, you we call ourselves mother of democracy. The, the, uh, we say, you know, Hinduism is the most pluralistic religion in the world. There is not a religion of the book. Many ideas flourish. There is different, you know, strands within the religion. So it, 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 even an atheist can be a Hindu, you know. There is at one level this entire argument about the liberalism of of, of Indians uh, heritage, 
On the other hand, there is this intolerance. And I think the two don't sit together. You know, if you believe actually that the Hindu religion and philosophy is a truly liberal philosophy because it's not of the book, it has multiple faiths in it. There is Shaivism, there's Vaishnavism, there's Vaita, there's Advaita, uh, you know, etc., etc., etc. Then you should allow a thousand flowers to bloom. I mean, to, to quote Marxism, you know, or a hundred flowers to bloom. Why go up to the BBC? I mean, I'm not defending, incidentally, I must add here, I'm not defending the BBC's uh, journalism. In fact, in the past, I have criticized the BBC when they were, for example, referring to terrorists as militants and saying, how can you do that? I mean, you know, you call chaps who go to New York uh, to 9-11 to as terrorists, those uh, come to Bombay as militants. I mean, this is not acceptable, right? right? So it's not the journalism of the BBC that I'm defending. Of. I'm just saying that don't harass media. It does a competent job or an incompetent job. There are many ways in which you can draw attention. So what is this insecurity about, Dr. Baru? Well, I think we've gone over this question again and again. I, frankly, I cannot understand what the insecurity is. Here is a government that has an absolute majority in parliament that can just do about what it likes to do. Um, why is it suddenly insecure is, is a baffling question. Is it that they feel that the ground is shifting from below their feet? Is that the assessment, that the ground is shifting? And therefore, you need to keep the faithful with you uh, because there's a lot of disillusionment even among the faithful. Uh, those who are the kind of the Sangh Parivar, as it was, or the Bucks, the questions, uh, people are unemployed, middle class unemployment has gone up after COVID. There's inflation. Uh, you know, so is it that people are asking the question, what is this Amrit Kal all about? Where is the Amrit in the Amrit Kal? Mm -hmm. Mr. Ram, you referred to this uh, earlier in uh, in our discussion, where you said that the that the BJP is a, is in a majority in Parliament, very powerful party. The the opposition, the the biggest opposition party, the Congress, is far weaker than it ever has been in its history. Do you think that's one of the reasons why uh, the Prime Minister, his party, his government is as um, is is coming out with these sort of you know raids or searches or surveys or whatever we we might call them and you know using a rocket launcher to to sort of kill a fly if you like is it because the opposition no, is I, weak? I'm more persuaded by what uh, Sanjay just said. Is the question is the ground shifting under their feet? And I think this yatra, Rahul Gandhi's yatra, surely has made a difference. But I don't know what kind of difference it's made. But nobody in recent memory has walked from uh, uh, Kanyakumari to Kashmir doing these distances, um, talking to people and really making an impact. Whether they can capitalize on it, the opposition or the, even the Congress in this case, uh, I don't know. But certainly uh, that is a major factor on the Indian political scene. And the question is, do they feel that the ground is uh, sh is shifting or has shifted under their feet already, given the difficulties it referred to. I think that's uh, that's the relevant question today. I think that the insecurity must uh, is likely to be highly likely to be related to that, rather than uh, their uh, feeling of uh, uh, great self confidence, assurance, or even arrogance for that. Maybe they're getting worried because things suddenly change. Jyoti, mm -hmm. you you need to say. You've been in journalism long enough, and I longer, uh, and we've seen uh, people who are at the top of their uh, top of the tree suddenly fall, and when the fall comes, it'll be like this rather than like this. So we don't know. Uh, maybe we are, <laughs> we are hoping that this authoritarian regime will not stay much longer. Many of us do. I do certainly. Or authoritarianism will disappear. We, we are. We want democracy to flourish. Only then India can do well globally, yeah. Uh, but uh, and for our people as well. But uh, is that happening? And that's a relevant question. We'll watch it in the next uh, several months whether the ground has really shifted under the feet. We have been wrong before, but this is the question that I'd be most keen on following. Well, we have one year left for the next general elections, so I suppose journalists like yourselves uh, and me, we will be watching this space. And uh, we will be reporting on it freely, fairly, without fear or favor. And notwithstanding what's happening to the BBC, I'm, I, I'm not sure whether the raids are still on or not. But I think we all agree that, that this is a highly unfair 
uh, thing to have uh, cracked down on the on a media organization, whether it's the BBC or any other Indian media organization. But thank you both so much, Dr. Sanjay Baru and Mr. Enram, for joining me in this debate, not just on the BBC, but on freedom of speech and expression in the media as guaranteed by our constitution. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti.